Okay. <clears throat> All right. Go with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Let's see here. What is that? 20 to 5? Is that what it says? All right. That's, there you go. All right, there you go. <laughs> okay. Now. <clears throat> We're looking at Acts chapter 3. I'm going to give you a couple of, of, well, basically all I do is read scripture and say it means what it says, you know? But some of the thing that, one of the reasons I do that is because as we read it, it makes you read it, you know, and you read, and we read exactly what it says rather than sometimes what we've been taught that it says. And so... I'm going to give you two examples. One, I'm going to give you out of scripture here, and then we're going to talk about another one. If we get, a, oh, I don't know if we get a chance today or not, but uh, if not, we'll do it first thing in the morning. Acts chapter three, starting in verse one, and we're going to, I'm going to break this up piece by piece and show you how many uh, traditions or sacred cows are destroyed just by this one passage. Okay. Now, just as I was talking with my brother there, that. Essentially, what this comes down to is that I'm really not here to impart anything in, in, in the sense of anointing and that kind of stuff. Really, my job here is to bring out the scripture and really to show you. It's not even to give you something. It is to really to reveal what you already have. All right? So, because if it's... If, it's, if you don't already have it, there's really not a lot you can do to get it. You understand what I mean? I mean, it's, it's either you got it or you don't. And as we see here, I will prove to you from other scriptures as we go on, what you already have, but have been either taught that you don't have, and if you don't think you have it, you won't ever walk in it. All right? And so I'm just going to show you what you have. Now, in that, Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, well, let's just stop at verse 1 there for a second. Where were they going? To the temple. Why were they going? To pray. All right, so what does that mean? They have not yet prayed. Right? So these are not prayed up men. Right? Okay. <clears throat> and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now, what was he asking for? Money. Alms, money, right? Was he looking for healing? No. no. Matter of fact, it even says specifically he was looking for money. Okay? Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Now, again, what's he looking for? Money. money. What did he expect to receive from them? Money, okay. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Now just stop right there. Strike number one. Poor Peter. Come on, anybody today knows that you don't tell people to look at us. Right? I mean, come on. Anybody that's been in church any length of time knows, what do we say? Look to Jesus. Right? And so poor Peter, he didn't have the benefit of our modern theology. He just walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Right? And yet, his theology is wrong, and ours is right, yet his works, and ours doesn't. Right? Okay. Just point out some things here that are obvious. Right? And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Well, what was he going, expecting? Money. Alms, money. Right. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Okay, now that's code word for I'm a Pentecostal. Okay, that's what that means. Okay. He says, but such as I have, give I thee. Okay, that's strike number two for Peter. Because you don't just say, I'm going to give you this. You say, like he's told the man, let's look to Jesus and see what he wants to do. And we're just going to pray and see what happens. Right? Isn't that the way most people talk generally? And, you know, they kind of have that, that attitude. But Peter didn't have that. Right? Peter said, look right here. And he said, what I got, I'm going to give you. Right? 
Now you start talking that way, and people are going to get mad. And they're going to look at you, and they're going to think, well, you're arrogant. Okay? And it's like I tell everybody, arrogance or faith always looks like arrogance to a religious person. Okay? So when you start walking in faith, religious people are going to call you arrogant. Right? Or proud or prideful or something like that. But it's funny too, we were talking last night, and people say, well, you know, how, how can you be that confident? You know, it's not right for you to be that confident. You being that young, you shouldn't be confident like that. Okay, look up the word confident and you'll see the synonym is faith. Alright? You look up faith and it says synonym is confidence. It means to have confidence in or trust upon. I, what people have to realize, what they see, they don't see that your confidence is not in you, that it's in Jesus in you to get the job done. You see? Because they don't... See, the Bible says that man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the inward man, on the spirit of man, right? And so we have to always remember not to judge people <clears throat> based upon their age or anything that we can see, all right? You don't judge based on that. And even Paul had to remind Timothy and say, Timothy, you know, <clears throat> let no man despise you because of your youth. In other words, Timothy was having problems with Older people that were saying, you're too young to be in a position of authority. You're too young to be doing this. Who are you to be telling me what to do? I've been studying the scriptures since before you were born. And they had all these things. And, and I'm sure Timothy said, yeah, but you've been studying them wrong. Because Paul, essentially what I'm teaching you this week is Paul's revelation. Bottom line, that's what it comes down to. It is what, it is what Jesus gave to Paul that made the difference between... Paul and Peter and these other guys. Alright? And you notice, Paul never really hooked up with them. You know, he'd go into the council, but he didn't... He didn't... He, You know, they'd say things, and he's like, well, we'll see. I mean, he didn't really bow to them. Alright? <clears throat> now he says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, you notice the man did not jump up and walk. The next scripture says, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now, notice Mark 16 says lay hands on the sick. Okay, two things to remember here. Number one, it does not say pray. It says lay hands. Right? How do you pray for the sick? Doesn't matter. Right? Well, I don't know what to say. Doesn't matter what you say. Right? For the most part. Matter of fact, you don't have to say anything. It says lay hands on the sick. Now, when you go into a funeral and you walk past the, the widow or the widower that's sitting there, what can you possibly say to really help? You know, other than go up to the casket and say, get up. Okay, yeah, you could say that, right? But I'm talking about from natural viewpoint, okay? You, you walk, and, but you don't know what to say. But what do you do when you walk up to them? Isn't that right? What? You lay hands on them. Why? Because spirit is conveyed by hands. Okay? It's also conveyed by words. But if you don't have the words, how you feel can be conveyed by a hand. <clears throat> you, you may remember as a child, your parents could take hold of you, and by how they held hold of you, you knew what they were thinking. <laughs> Isn't that right? <clears throat> Sometimes more sharply than others. Amen? And so hands can convey an emotion, or it can convey a spiritual state or spiritual power to a person. And so you don't always have to... It doesn't say anything about praying for the sick. Okay, Number one, I, hadn't, I really hadn't prayed for the sick in about 20-something years now. We minister healing. Because the Bible never says to pray for the sick. It says heal the sick. It says lay hands on the sick. It says... Now, th there is something similar to this over in James in chapter 5. It says that if a sick person calls for the elders. Then they go to them and they anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And it says they pray over him the prayer of faith. Okay? So that's as close to praying as you can get. Now, I believe Jesus prayed the prayer of faith. But you never see him praying. Right? And you many times you'll see the disciples come to Jesus and say, Lord, we pray thee, do this. Lord, we beseech you, do this. So praying doesn't mean necessarily praying. It can mean we're asking you. We, we're, we're, we're speaking to you about this. So, 
what I'm trying to get you away from is don't get hung up on methods. Okay? The message is sacred. The methods are not. You understand? There's all kinds of different methods. There's all kinds of different things. But we're trying to be more like Jesus. So we want our methods to be like Jesus, which means there's only a few things, there's only a few ways that he actually healed the sick. You know, laying hands on them, speaking a word to them, uh, taking dirt and mixing it with spit, right? And putting their eyes, okay, that's not a ministry most people want or receive well. But, you know, at one time the guy was mute and he touched his tongue and then, you know, spit on his fingers and put it on the, the man's tongue. Okay, that's not generally accepted today. So you may have to use other methods, all right? But it's not the method that counts. It's the message and the fact that you can transmit spirit power by whatever method you choose. Now, I've had people ask me, which method is the most effective? Very simple. The method you believe in. Okay? That's the one that works best. The one you've seen the most success with, either in your own life or in some, by someone else doing it, that's the method that is most effective for you. Now, just to give you an example and not to, um, and we're going to get back in Scripture in just a minute. We'll be talking about this later on when we talk about the anointing, but I wanted to share this with you because <clears throat> many times you read about Smith Wigglesworth and now people talk about the Wigglesworth anointing, which generally means punching people and they get healed. Okay? Because he would punch people. Now, I, as I said, I was with Dr. Sumrall and he spent time with Smith Wigglesworth, so he knew him Pretty well, I'll put it this way. Dr. Summerall knew Smith Wigglesworth better than anybody else that's living today. Okay? And, of course, Dr. Summerall passed away about 10 years ago, a little more now. But um, he was... <clears throat> when he talked about Wigglesworth, it was amazing because Wigglesworth is standing in line praying for people and there was this one guy standing there that had stomach problems and when he got to him, he said, What ails you? And he said, Well, it's my stomach. My stomach's just really, really bad. And so Wigglesworth said, All right. Step back. Punched him. Knocked the guy down. But when he got up, he was completely healed. All right? Which, if you hit me, when I get up, you bet I better be healed. Okay? <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> but now, then the, the next guy in line was standing there, and he saw all that. And when Wigglesworth got to him, he said, he said, what, what's the matter with you? And the guy was afraid to talk because he had a headache. All right? So he was afraid he was going to get punched in the face. Well... Then one time, Wigglesworth was praying for people, and he got to this woman and said, What ails you? Because that's what he always said, What ails you? And the woman said it was her stomach. And so he said, All right. Bam! Punched her in the stomach. It didn't knock her down. She just went back. She goes, Well, if it's a fight you want, and pulled her <laughs> and was fixing to fight with him. So it gives you an eye. It didn't always work smooth. All right? And that's why I tell everybody, you always like the dead people because you can control what they say. See? When Wigglesworth was alive, people didn't like him because he, he was mean. He was rough on people. And you like him now that he's dead because you get to pick and choose what quotes you want to use. All right? But when he's alive, you wouldn't have liked him. Hey, one guy came in his line one time. He'd prayed for him the night before and he said, uh, What's the matter with you? And he told him the problem. He said, Wait a minute. Weren't you here last night? Hadn't I already prayed for you? He said, Well, yeah. He goes, He turned him by the shoulders put his foot in his rear end and pushed him and kicked him off the platform and said, you're healed now and too dumb to know it. <laughs> right? And so, and then there's the story, it only happened one time, but there was a story where they brought a baby up and put the baby on the platform. The back then the platforms were about six foot high. <laughs> I do this, six foot high, so the people on the camera actually think I'm like, he must be six foot <laughs> <laughs> It's about six foot high. And <laughs> anyway, they put a, but the platforms are very high, so they had to set, up, set the baby up there. Wigglesworth, when he found out about it, the baby, it was a terminal illness type of situation. Wigglesworth walked up, instead of praying for the baby, kicked the baby. It was in a, it was in a thing. It was in a, like a basket. It wasn't just the baby. It was in a basket. I know, I investigated this. I talked to people who were there, and I had to find out. Okay? All the stories I heard, they just put a baby up there, but it wasn't. He was in a basket. And so he kicked the basket and the baby into the audience. And when they caught the baby, the baby was healed. So, you know, now I always pray for that Wigglesworth anointing when I'm praying for family. Right? Because that's... <laughs> Alright, I'll pray for you, but I feel a Wigglesworth coming on. You know? <laughs> you know? 
But see, now, but, but we've had all this teaching going on about the anointing and this and that. And honestly, okay, teaching is supposed to clarify, not mystify. All right? With the teaching on the anointing that's out there that I've heard, I was more confused after I heard it than I was before I heard it. Because I thought I had an idea, and then I hear what they say, and it's crazy stuff. You know, it's just out there. And so, I, um, you, you might want to write this down. An anointed man of God makes the complicated simple. An annoying man of God makes the simple complicated. Right? Remember that. Okay. Now, a lot of people thought that God spoke to Wigglesworth and said, kick this person, punch this person. Okay, that's not what happened. I talked with four people that were with Wigglesworth. I talked with one man that was his driver for 20-something years, was with him all the time. I talked with another man named George Stormont that was actually over in Minnesota that wrote the book um, Secret of His Power or something like that. No, there's about four of them out there. But Albert Hibbert, yeah, Albert Hibbert and a man named Hacking. I've talked to both of them. And I've even talked to Wigglesworth's grandson. And they were there when certain, you remember the incident where they stood the, where he stood the body up against the wall and they held him and he said, you know, be alive. And he said, turn him loose. And the body fell and he did that three times. And the fourth time they stood him up and said, live in Jesus' name. And the person took off walking. The person hold him fell. Just passed out. Was in shock. Um, I talked to the person that was present at that time. I think that was, uh, that was Stormont. And so I've talked to these because I've been, you know, like I said before, you go to the source. Go to the people, find out what was said. Well, Wigglesworth, went, God didn't whisper to Wigglesworth and tell him to punch people. When Wigglesworth was a young man, he had appendicitis. And a man and woman came to his house, found out he was sick, went to his room, and when they started praying, the young man jumped on Wigglesworth's bed with him having appendicitis and punched him in the stomach. And he was healed. Right? Now, later on, now Wigglesworth never punched anybody in the face. He never, pun- he never punched anybody for any reason other than stomach problems. Why? It worked for him. It's a method he believed in. It worked for him. It got him healed. And so he did it. He wasn't led to do it. It was something he had faith in. It was a way he could release his faith. All right? It wasn't a special anointing. It wasn't God directing him to do this. See, we've got, to, we've got to get back to reality at some point in the church and teach truth and teach... People have to realize walking in the Spirit does not... I have to word this just right. I don't want to say... I want to say it doesn't make you weird. But in some people's eyes, it will. But when I say weird, I don't mean weird like... You know, you, when you walk down the street, you got to be in, in what we call in the spirit. You know, drunk in the spirit. Okay? <clears throat> a lot of the things that we see in the church, we don't see in the Bible. When G, and Jesus, now, I'm, a, I'm not against anything. Okay? Per, in, in particular. What I'm against is whenever you build that thing into an idol. And that's all you do. You know what I'm saying? And then you have, you know, banners are great. I don't mind banners. And worship music, you know, and that kind of stuff. Just don't call that spiritual warfare. And stand in here and wave banners. And then when you walk outside the door, don't do anything else. And don't witness and don't do anything else. The devil really doesn't care what you do in here. Right? It's what you do out there. Most of the time, all your shouting and all your stuff in here, the devil doesn't even wake up for until you take it out there. And I'm not talking about just walking down the street shouting, but you know what I mean. At some point, do you realize a few years back it was a big deal about falling down? You know, line up, fall down. If enough people fell down, it was a good service. If they didn't fall down, it wasn't a good service. The spirit was there, it wasn't there and all that. Remember that? Okay. Yeah, it's still out there. Okay. In Jesus' ministry, the only people... Now, Jesus was the most anointed person that ever existed. Wouldn't you agree? And yet, he was able to walk through crowds and nothing happened. 
Isn't that right? And in his ministry, the only people that fell were the soldiers that came to arrest him. Right? And that wasn't a good thing. Isn't that right? You, do you understand that? Now, I'm not against you falling. Right? But I'll tell you this. I'm against fake falling. Okay? And the best way to stop that is quit having catchers. All right? Because then if it's real, it ain't going to matter. Right? And if it ain't real, I, I've seen people go, okay? <laughs> you know, when you see that, that's when you tell the guy behind him, move over a little bit. And he's going, kind of, oh, okay. And let him fall, okay? <laughs> see, I don't mind anything in general as long as it's real. All right? Because we've had enough fake, we've had enough gimmicks, we've had enough manipulation that the world, we're, we're irrelevant to the world. And for the church, do you realize in the beginning, when the church came to town, it was like in the Old Testament when the prophet came to town. Everybody said, why are you here? Are you here for peace? Or are you here for war? What do you, why are you here for? You, you know, you bring in the judgment of God or you bring in peace for us? And, and when the church was doing its job, it said great fear came upon the whole city. Right? Why? Because the church had something to say that affected things. And that's how God intends the church to be today. Right? But we have made it, you know, a carnival for the most part. And something that can't be taken seriously. And so we have to get that back. And that's, well, that's, you know, I'll talk, maybe talk about it later if you, if you ask me questions. Because, you know, we're, we're actually talking about starting a Bible school in Dallas. Well, we're going to start a Bible school in Dallas. And we've got things going on. But there has to be an approach to ministry that is, <clears throat> there's an earthly wisdom and a, well, the Bible says the earthly wisdom is a devilish wisdom, and then there's a heavenly wisdom, right? There's only two. <clears throat> we have built many Bible schools and church structures many times along the lines of earthly structure as opposed to heavenly structure. And we have to get people in character and build the character of Christ into them so that they can walk in the power of God without the power of God crushing them because of no character. Right? Does that make sense? And when that happens, then we can walk, well, like Jesus, like we're supposed to. Okay? So anyway, trying, trying to get beyond that. Um, <clears throat> just want to tell you that about Wigglesworth because it's just, we have all this stuff built up, all this weird stuff. And so, again, I'm not against anything you do in, in particular. Just, I'll say it this way. You will never, I don't care what you do, don't care about your prophecies, visions, dreams, Tongues, you know, healing. I don't care. You will never be more spiritual than whenever you are on a street corner witnessing to a person or a person that's in a gutter or a drug addict or an alcoholic or, a, you know, a, a <clears throat> the beaten wife or the wife beater. You understand? As when you're with, that's when you are the most spiritual. You understand? As when you're feeding the hungry clothing the naked, visiting prisoners. It's not <clears throat> all these other stuff, you know, dreams, visions, prophecies. Anybody can say anything today, right? And there's no guidelines. There's no, uh, you know, accountability for it. And, you know, if we put a sign up out front that said personal prophecy seminar, seminar place to be packed out because everybody wants a personal word from God, yeah. right? And, and we could do that and I could say, okay, thus saith the Lord, read your Bible, <laughs> right? Do your Bible, okay? And I could do it for every one of them, you know? And I would be more accurate than most personal words that people have gotten before. All right? Because at some point, we have to get back to the reality of what Jesus came to do. And we have become... I'm doing a newsletter right now that I'm fixing to send out. That It's an e-newsletter we do um, by email, obviously. And it is, um, it's on the three churches, or three Christianities, as I call it that we see, because I go all over the world, and I see basically three Christianities right now in full force. One of them is natural Christianity, which basically says God doesn't do what He used to do. You know, healings have passed away, powers passed away, now it's just fire insurance and be good. Pretty much it. Then there is supernatural Christianity, which says God still does what He's always done, and if there's any failure, it's on our part, and we need to find out where the failure is and fix it, and then walk in it. And then there's a third Christianity, which is actually the, the 
The, the first one and the third one are the two main ones that we see today. And the third one is what I'm basically calling pseudo-spiritual Christianity or even a hyper-spirituality, which means basically everything is super spiritual. And, you know, for it to be a good service, you have to have gold dust and, you know, oil on the hands and then everything else, okay? Now, just let me, let me point something out here because years ago... I was looking, and, and again, I know things happen, and whatever God does, I'm for. Okay? But every person in the early days of the gold dust and the oil in the hand, or coming off the forehead, every person that promoted that is now dead. Every one of them died. Right? Usually by cancer. And it, it started, I don't know if you remember or not, but it started by a woman named Savannah, Savannah. Uh, from uh, Argentina, I think it was, somewhere down there, anyway, uh, in South America. She brought it over here. It went to uh, Ruth Ward Heflin and then spread through. Um, but every person that's been involved in that, in that degree, is now dead. Bob Shadows was also involved in it. Now, I'm not saying they went to hell. You understand. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying whatever was going on, they're all dead now, and they're, they were all too young to die. Okay? And to be honest with you, I've not seen anybody that had any of those manifestations ever bring any person into discipleship or bring a person into the fullness of the Spirit of God. Okay? I see a lot of hype. I see a lot of things going on, a lot of activity, but everything is super spiritual and... <clears throat> It, it has gotten to a place, it's even hard to describe when you see it out there, but basically we have moved away from the Bible and now it is when an apostle or prophet speaks, that scripture, and that's what we're going to go by, and we have moved, I don't want to say away from the Bible, we've moved beyond the Bible is what they would say. Now, I am a stickler for scripture, all right? I, I don't... Um, We've got to get back to reality. And there has to be... I know there's always excess. I know that and I understand that. There's, in every movement, there's excess. And over a period of time, the excess starts to fall away and the truth is, is there. But it doesn't have to be that way because excess does two things. It draws flakes and rebels and it drives away people who are seriously seeking God. Okay? So that's what it does. And so we have to be able to present truth and be able to do it. I, I don't... Um, there's a lot more because of my study in history and stuff I could go into in different things. But in looking at Jesus' life, there's just a lot of things that he was a very common person. You know, he walked through crowds. Children loved him. He spoke with children. He, when he got tired, he sat down. He drank. He ate. He did these things. And he, but he was normal. But it's what I, what I call being naturally supernatural. You know, we should be... I'm a supernatural being. I'm a spirit being living in a body. Uh, I have a soul. You know, I'm, I'm born of God. I'm a spirit being having a human experience. I'm not a human having a spiritual experience. You understand? Now, in saying that, and if anybody knows me, if you're around me very much, you'll find out I'm, I'm extremely normal. Okay? You know, I believe in praying. I believe in fasting. But to be honest with you, I don't do it during meetings because it's hard to do that in fellowship with Christians because Christians fellowship around food. Right? That's where we meet. So, I don't, you know, <clears throat> spend, I don't spend, how can I say it? I don't spend hours and days in prayer prior to a meeting because... I can't and, and help you, you understand, and answer my phone and pray for people. And yesterday morning, yesterday, just as one example, the first hour I was awake, I got nine calls from India, I got eight, eight calls from South Africa, and five calls from Australia. That's the first hour, all right? And every one of them was a near-death situation. All right? Now, I try to be available, and I'm as available as I possibly can be, to be honest with you. It's, it's 
rough sometimes because of it. But I can't do what the church says I have to do to be spiritual and still be available to people and do what I'm doing. So if you would rather call me not spiritual because you don't see me pray even over my food every time, okay, or don't don't catch me praying, and you think, well, I never see him praying, so he must not be spiritual. Okay, I, w- I would rather be non-spiritual in your eyes, but effective for the kingdom, Amen. than for you to think I'm somebody by how I act and how I separate myself. Well, I got to protect the anointing, so during the breaks, I'm going to go hide. I don't do that, right? I don't protect the anointing. The anointing protects me. You understand? I don't, I don't have to go get... See, I don't pour out and then have to go get re-pumped up, you know, go back here and pray in tongues so I get the anointing back. No, it's called sowing and reaping. I pour out. He pours more in than I pour out. Right? I can't give out more than he pours in. You understand? And it, we keep a constant flow. So it's not a matter of me being super spirit. It's not what I've done. It's what Jesus did that allowed me to be a son of God that allows me to walk this way. Now, are there times when I get off by myself? Yeah. It, it's called driving here. Okay? I, I spent three days on the road driving here. Nobody in the car. You know, me and God. All right? And it was great. I enjoyed Put on some worship music. And put on a teaching CD, different things. You say, well, who do you listen to when you drive? Me. You know, sometimes. All right? <laughs> okay? Well, you just say, well, that, that's arrogant. Uh, no, you should worry if I wouldn't listen to me. All right? Because it would say there's something wrong. Right? Now, there's other people I listen to, too, and, and there's different times I listen to different things, but I'm not going to tell you a name because then you'll think I agree with everything they say, and I don't agree with everything anybody says any more than you're going to agree with everything I say. Right? right? But the bottom line is, let's get the job done. Yes. Amen? And so, you know, in saying that, I, I, I'm trying to emphasize, we didn't start out natural and become spiritual in, in that sense of, well... If you look at Jesus and the disciples, Jesus lived his life spiritually. But he did normal things. Right? He didn't hide in a monastery. There was times when he went off to the mountain and that kind of stuff, but most of the time he spent with people, he did things, he was normal. And I just I have a problem with people that have to get away from people to be strong spiritually. Right? When the reason for your strong spirituality is to help people. So at some point we have to realize that there is nothing you can you can't pull on me enough to pull God out of me to where I need I gotta go hide and get more. You understand? The more I talk about it, people say, Well, you know, don't you get wore down or don't they, you know, where are you at? No. When I talk about God, even now or when I'm during the break, I get stronger. You you don't drain me. I, build, I get built up, right? You talk about the things of God, you talk about, and when I'm talking to you during the breaks, we're talking about the things of God. I get stronger, Amen. right? It's not about me getting weaker and, well, I gotta go. No, physically I may get tired, but generally most time I don't, you know? <clears throat> and, man, I, I've just got back from Indonesia. We were there three weeks and three days. I mean, literally, I did not have even the thought of a day off until we were there like... Uh, 18 days, 19 days, no, 20, we were there 24 days. 24 days before I even got a, a break, right? And I'm talking 9 to 5, then 7 o'clock healing services. I'm talking about, talking with hundreds of people every day. People came from all over the islands just to come up and talk with us. So even whenever we were supposed to have a day off, it wasn't because people were there waiting to talk, waiting for prayer. People fly in, they're dying of cancer, they're dying of various diseases. How do you take a day off? How do you tell them, we'll come back tomorrow? You can't tell them that. They, they may be dead by tomorrow. And then they'd say, and invariably, everybody says, would you come over here? Would you, know, would you come, we got a person at this home, but they can't, we weren't bringing the meetings, they can't come, can't get them out of the house. We went through Muslim neighborhoods, driving up and walking down alleys, and the people that came to get us, we didn't even know who they were. For all we knew, they were taking us somewhere to kill us. And we go walking through this alley, and all these people come out and looking at us, and you know, you see all the shrines, and you know, there's different religions there. But you walk to these places, and you go into a house, and you know, there is no air conditioning; everything's open, and it's you know, from the minute you get off the plane, you break a sweat, and you stay sweating until you leave. 
you know, until you get back on the plane. And which doesn't bother me. I'm from Texas. Like I said, it's, you know, I like heat better than I do cold. Okay? I can deal with heat. Cold, I, no, nah, that's, it, you know, I always tell everybody, if the ground is white, it ain't right. Right? <laughs> Simple as that. So, <laughs> okay? But we go through these places and you, you go into this house and it's, you can hardly breathe. You know, just because the air is still, there's no air, there's no wind blowing, nothing. And you go into a room that a person has a disease that you can smell before you get in the room. And you go in there and, and then you look at this person and you think, my God, look at the condition. You know, and there's that split second of humanity where you just look at him and go, you, you look at him like, what could possibly be done? You know, what could cause it, but what, could, what can help it? You know what I'm saying? There's that, there's that little spark of humanity left where you think, this is impossible, but for God, you know? But then you realize, oh yeah, I represent him. And then you get to walk over to him and just begin either, you know, ask some questions. What about this? What's the situation? Give me, give me a name. Give me some symptoms. Let me know what, what, what am I fighting? You know, that's not necessary, but it helps you to focus. And then you hear what the doctors say or different things and... And you look at this person, and you know they say, "Well, it's terminal; they're going to die." They're, as a matter of fact, the one we went to visit, the first one there, uh, they said they may be dead before we get there. I mean, it was that close. And we go over, and it was a 22-year-old young boy that you couldn't you couldn't tell what he was actually at that point, but had gone. He was born with a cleft palate. The doctors had gone in to fix it, and they did something wrong. And he had a reaction to the medicine, which caused him to cough, which ripped open the sutures, which caused some drainage and different things, and it had it caused blood poisoning, and it was a matter of less than hours. I mean, it was, it was over. And so we go in, and the smell, like you wouldn't believe. And you go in there, and you look at it, and you, then you have to realize, you have to look at this thing and go, you know what? Usually I do this before, I, and I, when I go into a hospital room, I, I stand outside the door before I even see them. And I, and I tell them, God, I know, what, I, I do not know what's on the other side of this door, but I do know this, whatever's on the other side of this door, there's nothing over there that you and I together cannot beat. And so I just thank God, usually I say something along the lines of, Father, I just thank you for allowing me to participate in the healing of this person, whatever it is. And then I walk to the door, and when I walk to the door, I walk in, like the president. You know, I walk in with some authority. And I walk in there because I know when I walk in, I don't know the other people in that room. I don't know if they're born again or not. But I know this. If they're not born again, I know that when I walk in that room, I am the highest ranking spiritual being in that room. I know that there is no devil in there that outranks me. I know there is no sickness in there that outranks me. I know that I represent Jesus Christ. The, the chain of command is the Father, the Son, and the Son. And when I walk in there, I speak for the Trinity. Not, not the Trinity I just mentioned, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the real Trinity. Okay? Get that right. But I represent Him. Now see, when I go in, and I know it's after five. I'm sorry, but you're still kind of carrying on here a bit. But, so, you know, as I say, but, that means I'm not going to stop. That means I'm going to keep going. So, you know, okay? And what we have to realize is that when, when I walk in there... See, when I stand before you here... Okay, this is not the time to be... How can I, how can I say it? Um, your definition of humble. You understand? Because if I come in here and go, Well, you know, I, I'm nothing, I don't count, and it doesn't matter, and, and just, you know... I just, you know, I, I'm just so thankful, God, that I'm just even here. I just, I don't know what to say. I'm just, and, you know, I don't want to uh, think or make you think that I know anything because, uh, you know, I just, he's going to bring knowledge down. He's going to make, you know, uh, okay, that's not why you're here. You understand? It's not why I'm here. Now, when I get before God and I spend time with God and I tell God, God, you know, you know. I have done nothing right to be in this position. I don't deserve to be in this position. I hadn't done any type of anything to make it work. 
And I tell God, if you ever want to shut this thing down, you just do it. I don't, you know, you do it. I, it doesn't matter to me if I'm doing something wrong, if I'm leading people wrong. Shut this thing down. And every time I pray that, a new country opens up. And we get new letters and new calls and new things coming in from different places. And it expands again. And so, then, so I stand up when I go before God. That's what I tell Him. God, you know me. You, you know you know, where I came from. You know I'm just glad to be here. I, I've had guns put to my head. I've had knives pulled on me. I had an AK-47 put on me there in Africa. And I was there. I've had, you name it, I've had close calls, okay? I had one person put a 357 to my head and say, you, you know, you ready to go? I'll pull the trigger. I'm like, pull the trigger, I'm ready to go. You know, and, then, and of course the inside of them go, I'm not real sure I'm ready to go right now. You know, <laughs> you know, but I mean... I, I was ready to go. You know, I'm ready with God to go, but I wasn't real willing to go at that point. So, but, but I've had those situations, you know. And, and I, I've told God, God, you know. This is you. You've done this. I could not do this. I tried for years. I mean, really, you know, preaching when I was in another group and, you know, was preaching their message. And, man, it was like beating my head against a wall. I mean, no, no doors, nothing. And then... We get a hold of this and start praying in our home and boom. I mean, within a matter of a year or so, we're worldwide. I had Sid Roth call me and put me, put me on his radio program, on his television program. We've been book solid since. And that was in, what, 01? And I mean, just straight through, you know. And I made a vow to God from even before, back even before I was even preaching. I said, God, if I'm ever in a position like that to where people would want to hear anything I have to say... Number, number one, I will never ask for a place to preach. I will never call somebody and say, can I come preach there? I said, you will set my schedule. And, and to this day, we have never asked for a place to preach. And we are booked. If I want time off, we have to schedule it. Right? But, it, but it's not, we don't call people. I have preachers tell me, hey, if you're ever in the area, you call me and let me know. And I said, well, you know, I may show up or something like that, but I, you know, I, I'm not going to make you think I'm calling to ask for a place to preach. If I show up, I'm not there to preach. I'm there to sit back there. You know, now, if you call me up to preach, I'm always ready. I'm always ready. But I didn't show up to preach. You understand? I showed up to fellowship, visit with the pastor, that kind of thing. I don't expect... See, that's why you can't let me down. I don't expect anything from you. See, if I expect something from you, if you are my source, then i got to preach what will get the most money out of you. Right? And I got to preach something you will like, and I got to preach what I think will do the most money, right? If, that, if you're my source. But if you're not my source, then I can preach truth to you as the Bible says what it is, and I can preach it straight. And if I walk out of here without a dime, it doesn't make a difference because God knows my budget, He knows what we have to have, He knows what salaries we have to pay. And if, I do, if, if it doesn't come in here, guess what? God will move on somebody somewhere. To put a check in the mail and be waiting on me when I get back to Dallas. We've seen it. I've, we go to places that there are no offerings. We go to Indian reserves up in Canada. We go to Indian reservations here in the States. We don't go in there and take up offerings. We go in, we take material and give it away. T-shirts, you know, we give it away. Why? Because we're sowing into them. Because we know there's no money there. Right? And we don't go in there. Now, now, and we'll tell them, look, you know, here's how God can bless you. But I don't expect anything from them. And so if I don't expect anything from you, you can't let me down. And that way, the next time I see you, I won't feel bad towards you because you didn't treat me right. Right? First off, getting treated right, pretty much way overdone for the most part. You know? We got to get away from Christian celebrities. All right? Especially, especially preachers. You understand? I'm not a celebrity. I, I'm here to help you. I'm here to serve you. Right? I'm, I'm going to do the best I can to get this into you. And you'll get it. You, people do. They get it. You know, you say, well, we didn't cover a lot of manual today. Doesn't matter. You watch. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. Right? And if I'm speaking his words, then my words are spirit and life. And they go into you and they activate things in you. And what we're doing is we are unveiling to you who you already are. Not giving you anything new. We're opening application and computer terminology, you bought the disc, you paid for one thing, but you got ten things on it. Well, I'm here to unlock the other nine. Amen? They're already there. You already got them. Somebody's calling me. <laughs> nope. Okay. Never mind. <clears throat> so, the reason I'm saying that is because I want you to understand 
we have to be, if you're weird, people are not going to approach you. They're not going to ask you for help. You understand? If you're weird, children are going to run from you, not to you. Okay? We don't have to be weird. We can be very normal and be spiritual and have the power of God. I, I have proven that. All right? I have taken everything that the church has taught about what it takes to walk in power and have purposely done the opposite. And then cast out devils and heal the sick. All right? And seen it done. God has been good to us as He has been to you, regardless of what you think. All right? And we have seen every type of sickness, every part of the body healed. We've seen everything like that. We've seen nine come back from the dead so far. Two were twin babies and still in the womb that had been dead two weeks. All right? Two weeks dead and the doctors were going to take the babies. And the woman came to the meeting. We prayed for her. I, I don't touch women's stomachs, so I had her put her hands on her belly, which was out here. And I put my hand on top of hers and commanded. I said the same thing to her children that I said to my daughter when I was carrying her around dead in my arms after she fell out of a second floor window. And she was dead for 45 minutes, my daughter. And then these, these kids, I put my hands on her stomach and said, In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. It was that simple. I said it once or twice. The woman went back and sat down. An hour later, when the service was out, she was going home. And she thought, she would, the doctor said that she would start to abort the children when, when it was time. And she felt the movement going on. She went to the hospital. Both boys, alive. Was born a couple of hours later. Amen? So, we've, we've seen... I've seen things that... I've, I tell people all the time, I'm not ready to go. I just turned 50 April 1st, right? So I'm not ready to go anywhere yet. But if I did, and that's not a lack of faith, you understand, but if I did, I would have no regrets. You know, I've seen everything I've ever wanted to see, done everything I've ever wanted to do. I've seen God do things that, honestly, not a lot of people have seen. But more people are seeing it. The people we trained up in Harrisonburg, that I told you where I made the statement about the building coming down in Spokane. Uh, two weeks after we left, a woman dropped dead in the middle of service. Sunday morning, just drops over dead. Bam. And they stand around and look at it, and they call 911. It takes a while for the, them to get there, and they said, well, she's dead. We can't hurt her. Let's do what Brother Curry taught us. And so they all got around her, started praying, laid hands on her, commanded her to live. Two or three minutes, she comes back, gets up. Nine uh, the EMTs get there. They check her out. They wanted to take her in. I think they did take her in actually for um, observation overnight. But everything was fine. Right? So, and that, I didn't do that. They did that. You understand? I could go on and on. With, with I could be here two weeks doing nothing but testimonies. Forget teaching, just testimonies. That's what I'm saying. I'm trying to get across to you. What I'm teaching you works. Amen? But we've got to get out of our religious mindset and think that God... We're, that, that God's going to reward us because it's not... He, he, rewards, he rewards those that believe in Him. You understand that? But it's not a reward for how good you do. It, it, it is in faith you step out and you do the things He's commanded you to do and you forget you. You know, forget your faith, forget where you are, forget your gifts, forget, forget all that. Get your stuff out of the way and just help people. And when you get yourself out of the way, then it's not, well, do I have enough faith? It's just a matter of what do you need? Oh, well, of course God would do that for you. You know, why wouldn't he? He gave you Jesus. If he'll give you Jesus, with Jesus, he'll give you everything else. So whatever you, you can't ask for, you can never ask for anything bigger than what God has already given you. Everything else you ever ask for is going to be smaller because it's going to be less than Jesus. Amen? And if he gave us Jesus, come on, of course, healing? What is that? What, do you think that's a problem? But we have to move from trying to be priest in the old covenant temple to being priest under a new covenant and being representatives, ambassadors of Jesus Christ. People who are sent on a mission who can speak with the authority of heaven. That whenever I stand before God, yes, I am humble before God. I bow my knee to Him. He, see, everything above me, I bow my knee to. Everything below me, I put my foot on. You understand? That's as simple as that. If it's a demon, if it's sickness, whatever, I put my foot on it. It's less than me. If it's, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, guess what? Yes, sir. It's, I bow my knee. That's the way it is. Amen? Whatever they say, just like we say, your wish is my command. What do you want done? Just, you name it. You know, like David's 
uh, men when, when he said, Oh, what I wouldn't give for a drink of that water. And they went into the heart of the enemy just to get a cup of water to bring back. And he had just mentioned it as a wish. Think about that. Why can't we be that way with God? You know, instead of, Well, God, when you make me move, I'll go do it. You know, and God's pushing. You're kind of like, you know, digging in your heels and, and trying not to do something. But when you stand before God, yeah, you bow your knee. But when you stand before men, you don't stand there as nothing. You represent the God of heaven. And so you don't speak like them. You speak like Him. Do you understand? And when you speak like Him, you will affect their lives. And that's, that, why do you think they said He spoke as one that had authority? Why? Because He had authority because He represented heaven. He didn't do his own will. He didn't speak his own words. You understand? That's why when, whenever I minister to the sick, I don't ask a lot of questions. And you won't hear me say, Heavenly Father, please touch. You won't hear. Now, I may do this because I don't know who I'm dealing with. I don't know if they're Christian or not Christian or anything else. Or if I'm out in public, I may pray this way. But you'll notice the difference. I'll say, Father, I thank you for letting me participate in this. And I thank you that by Jesus' stripes they're healed. So in Jesus' name, I thank you for that now. And then that's when I stop talking to God. And then I shift my attention and I start talking to their body. I start talking to that sickness. I start talking to those demons. And I start telling this thing. Now, body in the name of Jesus, you will hear and obey the voice of the Word of God. That's me. And I say, you will do this. You will be healed in Jesus' name. You will function correctly. Every system of the body begin to function correctly. Eyes see in Jesus' name. Blood pressure return to normal. You will do your job. Back, you be healed. You do your job. And you start to speak. You tell devils, devil, you will go. You will not disobey. You will not hesitate. You will go now. And you start to speak that way to these things. And then people will go, that's God. Not me, but that voice. They will hear the voice of God coming out of your mouth. You understand? That's who you are. You are not, you know, sinners saved by grace. All right? You were sinners. You're saved by grace. Now you are representatives of God. And you represent God before men, and you represent men before God. But you have to differentiate between the two. You don't talk the same way to both. Amen? So, now, and again, if you think, yeah, but, but you don't know where I came from. You don't know what I've done. Well, no, and neither does God. Amen. Right? He said, I'll never remember your sins. I'll never, rem come on. You either believe the Bible or you don't. You're the only person remembering. And if somebody else brings them up, guess what? They're working with the devil. Because he's the only one that remembers. Right? So, if you forget who you are, See, what you have to see, your problem is it's not everything everybody else or God. Your problem is you can't forget who you were. But once you forget who you were and start to realize who you are, then you will start to speak that way, and then sickness, disease, devils, and all these other things under your feet will start to obey you. Right? But you have to convince them to obey you. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand up. Wow. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. All right, we're going we're gonna to end this this way today. I didn't get to finish Acts 3. We'll do it tomorrow, but, uh, but we'll just do it tomorrow. So, All right, say this with me. Say, Father, Father. and say it like you mean it. Father. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name I, thank you I thank you that I am, that I am who you made me to be. I'm not trying to become. I'm not trying to become. I'm just being. I'm just being. I don't have to become. I don't have to become. You made me. You made me. I'm not an evolutionist. I'm not an evolutionist. I'm not going to evolve into a Christian. I'm not going to evolve into a Christian. I'm a creationist. I'm a creationist. You made me a new creation. You made me a new creation. What I am, you made me. What I am, you made me. In a split second. In a split second. I didn't evolve into it. You made me it. I am a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
and all things that are new that are in me are of God. I'm a new creation. I have the mind of Christ. I have the Spirit of God. I have the Word of God. I have the power of God. I am anointed. I am absolutely filled with the Spirit of God. I speak to myself. I encourage myself. I build myself up by speaking to myself. Every day, I command my body to do its job. Every day, I tell my body what to do. It doesn't tell me. It's not in control. I'm in control. My spirit tells my body what to do. Tells my mind what to think. I say, soul, bless the Lord. Forget not. Forget not all his benefits. All his benefits. Who, forgives all my iniquities. Who forgives all my iniquities. Who heals all my diseases. So I am forgiven. Clean before God. Clean before God. Righteous. Righteous. Healed. Healed. Saved. Saved. Delivered. Delivered. Prosperous. Prosperous. Walking, in the of God. Walking in the knowledge of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let out a shout. Hallelujah. Praise your Father. Hallelujah.